Hey everyone, welcome back to The Negotiation. On today's show, we have a really informative and high energy conversation with Lauren Hallinan, head of marketing at Chatley and author of Digital China, working with bloggers, influencers, and KOLs. On today's show, we really dive into influencer marketing in China, discussing the platforms, social media, innovation, and penetration techniques. Lauren talks to us about using micro-influencers and professes a love for WeChat that may even eclipse my own. We talk about live streaming, particularly live commerce, and how that works using KOCs, a term we just learned about on our last show. We also talk about private traffic and how difficult that is to come by now for brands, given all their customer interactions are on social media, and how there's finally a growing market for secondhand goods in China, led by Alibaba's platform called Idle Fish. Enjoy. In China, everything's done on WeChat. Everything's done on Weibo. Everything is done on social media. Like Chinese people do not read email unless you force them to. Like they really, they don't read emails. They don't use websites. Everything is done on social media platforms. And so it's really difficult as a brand to have that owned traffic because it's, it's none of the traffic is really yours. At the end of the day, the platform could take it all away from you. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally-minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early-stage tech companies enter the Asia-Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Lauren, thanks for coming on the show today. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, glad to be here. In the past, as a lot of our regular listeners know, we, we try to dive into a little bit of somebody's China stories. And usually there's some very interesting and awesome ways that people just kind of actually back fell backwards over into China. So what are some of the more interesting ways in, in, in your career that you what, what led you to end up happening to be involved with all things China? It's funny because when I looked back, when I started to have people ask me this question, I had to really think hard, like, how did I end up in China? Um, I think that what happened was that I grew up in a fairly small town in upstate New York, which is where I'm back based now. Um, and I never got to really travel internationally um, growing up. And that's something I always wanted to do. And so as soon as I was in college, uh, you know, old enough, you know, 18, and I started just, you know, I went backpacking in Europe, I took all these school trips to, I went to South America, you know, and then of course, I was like, well, I'm definitely going to be studying abroad. And so, um, and I was an international relations major, like you could tell just tell I had the travel bug right I mean I'm an international relations major um, and uh, and you know so I was trying to figure out we had to choose a, a language to study and an area of the world to focus on and I just kind of went through a list of all possible places in the entire world you know the different regions that we could choose and I was like Europe is beautiful but I don't really see like what career like you know there's not much of a career that I'm gonna build there you know and I was like you know, this part of the world's too dangerous, this part of the world I'm not really interested in. And it was honestly a process of elimination, just like thinking about where would be the best part of the world to develop my career, but also an area of the world that I was very interested in. And that just ended up being China. So I started studying Chinese um, and went abroad in my junior year to, to China, um, having absolutely, I mean, this was in uh, you know, uh, what was oh nine? Um, so it was right after the Olympics. Um, but I, I went there with like absolutely no idea what China actually looked like, you know, like back in, I mean, even, even today, I feel like most Americans don't know what China really looks like no, and what it's true. really like, you know? And yeah. now I think there's a lot more, um, 
TV shows, movies, just there's, there's more of China available. It's like a young person is actually really interested in China. There's a lot more, I think, visual assets that they can go and actually see like, what does this place look like? But, you know, back in 09, they're really wasn't so I was just like had no idea what I was getting myself into and just went to China I still could like barely speak any Chinese and I just I got bit by the 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 learning Chinese bug and I just I was supposed to stay for one semester I ended up staying for two semesters I went back with one semester of college left and I was like as soon as I graduate I'm finding a way to get back to China I was like I just I have to get my Chinese to be like you know up to you know, conversational professional fluency, like, cause I just like, I just got bitten by the, the learning Chinese bug and just like the fast pace of everything that was going on there. And it was just so fascinating to me. And so, you know, I went back after college thinking I'd be there for a couple of years to like keep studying Chinese, get a little bit of work experience and ended up staying for eight years. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got into, into China. Okay. So now need a jungle how about how? <laughs> well, it already sounds better than mine. Well, congratulations. I struggled studying Chinese. Uh, it was a really, it's a, it's a really, really hard language to master. Really, really difficult. If I, I mean, it's funny because I, um, Man, if I could just study Chinese all day, every day, like I, I will, I look back on the, 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 you know, brief couple of semesters where I got to do that, and you know, I, you know, complained a little bit about it back then, but honestly, I would, I would just love to, you know, put the world on pause and go back and study. I just think it's a, a fascinating language, and I, I, I uh, yeah, it's, it's haven't gotten to do as much of it since being back in the U.S. And you could spend now. your whole life doing it. Because it oh, is yeah. so deep. Oh yeah. So I, I still I still struggle. I will I will always struggle. I will never ever say I'm fluent in it. There's no way you can if somebody says they're fluent, I think that's BS. <laughs> I think it, somebody told me once that you needed to you needed to know two thousand characters to be able to read the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Which was pretty incredible. And yet there's something like a hundred thousand characters out there. Yeah, it's 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 a, a never ending process. Yeah, but and it's it's the way it's built. It's so completely different. Um, the way they put um, different characters together to form new characters um, that have the basis of wood or water or earth or what have you. And, um, well, I'll tell you an interesting story. So I still read a lot. Um, I read a lot of Chinese um, on a daily basis, um, and because my career is very focused around. Chinese social media, um, the latest, just the latest product trends, the latest marketing trends, influencer trends. So I'm reading a lot um, of, so th there's a lot of new terminology that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, that's where it's really fascinating for me is that I'm actually learning words that a lot of Chinese people like don't even don't even know because they're it's new slang that's popping up on the internet um it's very like uh you know nuanced professional language so i i just love um it's it's the, the language itself is still evolving on a daily basis how important has it been for you to understand what's going on in china to be able to know the language to be able to read in chinese and be able to stay abreast of everything that's happening I personally think it's incredibly important. And that was actually one of my biggest drivers to make the commitment to really learn, learn the language um, is because I feel like if you can't read the language, then you're always getting third party information. You're always getting information through somebody else's lens. You're never getting it firsthand. Um, and even if you speak to a Chinese person about something um, and you're having a conversation in English, the way that they're going to talk to you about that exact same topic in English, even if they're like completely fluent, there's just going to be nuances in in English, um, the way that they, they're going to leave things out, they're not going to express it exactly the same as they would if they were talking to their friend in Chinese. Um, that's something that I, I definitely noticed early on is, is just that, again, yeah, if you're speaking the same exact person, same exact topic, they're speaking in English versus Chinese, you're not going to get the same story. So for me, it's always been very important because I feel like I can read so much more into a trend and what people are saying if I can actually read it in, in Chinese um, instead of relying on somebody else to give me the information. Can you break down a little bit about what right now the social media landscape looks like in China, the different platforms? 
Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that WeChat has really become even more of, you know, everything. Um, so uh, I, I guess what I mean by that is, mm, I think of WeChat less as a social media platform and more of a operating system. So it, it has social media, um, but it's also, you know, essentially it started out as a chat app and then it added social media components, but now it also has search. Like I don't really use Baidu anymore. I, I just go search for information on WeChat search. Um, it has commerce through e-commerce mini programs. Um, and that has been rapidly growing over the past two years. Um, a lot of, and a lot of, I mean, most, uh, most international brands are considering adding uh, WeChat e-commerce into their China e-commerce strategies these days. Um, customer service, people go to WeChat. Um, I mean, it's just WeChat has essentially become, like I said, an operating system for, for life in China. Your payments, oh, yeah. your WeChat pay. Completely. Um, so I think that that while it is part of social media, most definitely, um, it, it also kind of has its own place. It's a it's a super app that does that does everything. I am still back in the U.S., but I because my work is involved with China, I'm on WeChat all the time. And um, it I mean, it's it's incredible the amount of functions and features that this one platform has um all you know all contained in one one little app <laughs> yeah. um but what else beyond, is there mm -hmm. yes yeah, so yeah beyond that like you mentioned weibo i think people have always have been talking about weibo dying for years now um but weibo i i don't think is going to to you know leave us anytime soon it was one of the earliest major social media networks in China. It's, uh, it's a household name. It's, it's, you know, it's really like Facebook in many ways. It's maybe users have gone down, but it's, it's, it's just kind of part of the fabric of social media. Um, and it's a very popular place to run, uh, brand campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, work with influencers, people go there for news, people go there for celebrity gossip. Um, it's just kind of part of the fabric of social media. It's not, it's not exciting. It's not flashy. It's not the newest thing, but it's right. just kind of the base of, you know, any brand should be considering having Weibo as, as part of their the strategy. Well, it's, kind of, um, it's more limiting. Mm -hmm. There's more parameters. There's, there's, there's kind of less that you can do. It's certainly not like a WeChat. Yeah, it's more it is more of a Facebook or a Twitter. Um, I just I think they have different purposes. Um I, totally. I think Weibo is completely for you know, for social media, for marketing, for advertising, brand building. Um, whereas WeChat, um, you know, we think more of um for customer service, loyalty programs, e commerce, um it's 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 much more like your your website, your email marketing. Um, it's 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 less um, less social, I think, actually, than many people than many people think. Okay. Um, and then on top of that, um, I would say that the other big platforms. Um, well, there's Douyin, which is the the Western version is TikTok. Um, they're actually two, you know, two separate platforms. The China internal version is called Douyin. Um, and that took off way before, you know, uh, TikTok uh, took off in the West. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty similar as far as the, the format and features, um, except for, you know, Douyin is, is about a year or two ahead of, of what we're seeing on, on TikTok. TikTok. Um, and I think Douyin, it's a, it's a short video platform for anyone who's not aware of what TikTok is. Um, it's, a, it's a short video platform, very popular among young people. The other platform that has kind of become a mainstay of many brands' marketing efforts is Xiaohongshu or uh, Red, Little Red Book. It's got multiple English names. And this platform is a, what I would call a mix between Instagram, 
Pinterest and blogging. Um, and it's a product recommendation platform. So uh, people are going on there to write about their experiences with, with certain products and share knowledge with other users. And users are going on there to, to search for products they're interested and in, seeing what other people are saying about them. So that platform has become extremely popular over the past two years as well. I want to go back to something you said um, about you don't do search on on Baidu anymore. You do it on WeChat. I think that is a very interesting turn of events of the way things have happened in China. And I know that it also helps people understand the sentiment of their following, their audience um, uh, around a certain product, which is starting to mean more than an arbitrary or third party advice or, or review of a certain product. Can you talk just a little bit about, just go into that more and how that has shifted because I'm pretty sure you're not the only one. I think that's what a lot of people are doing now. I'm curious as to why. Yeah, so I mean, I think Baidu has gotten a, a, a pretty bad rap over the past couple of years. Um, they are very different than Google. You can be assured that the top top search results on Baidu are all going to be sponsored and they're not going to be clearly marked as sponsored. And there have been uh, a lot of cases where people have searched on Baidu and, you know, believed that the best result was actually the best product. Uh, one time it was a hospital, uh, you know, the things like that. And, and, they, and they've been misled and, and there have been serious consequences. And so Baidu's kind of got and lost the trust of the people um, as far as the quality of their, their search results. Um, and so over the past couple of years, WeChat has really built out its search capabilities. And um, because of you know, most these days, uh, I mean, all media outlets in China have WeChat official accounts and are publishing uh, content on a daily basis. Plus, you have all of the, you know, independent um, what we call we media, which are kind of uh, media founded by by KOLs. Um, and then there's KOL uh, influencer accounts. Um, and, uh, you know, you've also got official accounts from brands. Um, you know, you've just got so much on WeChat now that the the information that you're able to find through a, a WeChat search is, is actually, I think, much better, um, newer, you can find better results than than you can on um, you know on Baidu, and and I think it's also part of the convenience factor, right? So we're using WeChat all the time. I can easily just pull down you know my my chat feed and type something into the search bar and search right there without having to leave the app, without having to go click on like Safari and press Baidu and search in Baidu. Um, it's, it's all within WeChat, which is one of the reasons, I mean, it's the main reason why WeChat has become so popular in the first place is that you're keeping people within the ecosystem. So Lauren, you're also an Amazon bestseller, uh, bestselling author. Uh, you've written a book called Digital China, Working with Bloggers, Influencers, and KOLs. Just give us what it says on the back of the book. Um, explain to us briefly just what the book is all about. Yeah, I mean, the book is really an, an introduction. It's a 101 class on influencer marketing in China. Um, but more than that, you know, so the, the first section of the book is really talking about um, the, those main Chinese social media platforms, um, some of the ones that we just discussed, well, all of the ones that we just discussed, as well as a couple of other key platforms um, and kind of what the platforms are and the main types of content and how they're used. Um, and then kind of the second half of the book goes more into influencers, different types of influencers, how you work with them, um, kind of predictions for the future. But yeah, I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a 101 for brands who are thinking about social media marketing and, uh, and influencer marketing in China. Let's start our own little awards show and let's hand out some awards to some top companies that are doing things right, in your opinion. So what are, you know, what are the nominees for global brands that are running effective influencer marketing campaigns in China right now? Um, yeah, so I was, I was thinking about this question actually ahead of the interview. Um, I was, I was kind of struggling a bit with this question. Um, not because, not because there aren't, global brands who are running really good influencer campaigns, but it was more of that I 
could not think of, I was struggling to think of, of a couple that really stood out as far as their influencer marketing efforts in China. And what I mean by that is that right now, domestic Chinese brands are growing very quickly and they are the ones that are, are, are being the most innovative when it comes to influencer marketing, social media marketing in China. A lot of international brands are very competent, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they're playing by the books. Um, you know, influencer marketing is nothing new these days. You know, it's, it's been around uh, for, for quite a while now. It's become a staple of everybody's, you know, marketing strategies. All of the big Western brands are doing it. You know, they're holding offline events. They're working with all different you know, sizes of influencers. They're trying different platforms. But I think when it comes to the really innovative things that I've been seeing going on, I would actually say that the, the, the Chinese domestic brands are, are actually doing a better job. Is there some specific tactics that they're using to be, as you call them, very innovative with influencer marketing? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, they're, they, they've been coming up. The local brands have really been the leaders in some of the kind of the 2019 trends in influencer marketing. So uh, one of those is KOC marketing, uh, key opinion customers. Uh, so uh, often talked about is this uh, domestic beauty brand called Perfect Diary. Um, you know, they've, they've been talked about a lot this year um, just because they're, they're having incredible results. Um, and they, I believe, were only founded in 2016. Um, they're a very new brand, and they were able to gain a lot of traction very quickly by working with thousands of very small influencers, which are these KOCs, like key opinion customers. They're people who have maybe at most a couple thousand followers, um, you know, very, very micro long tail influencers. Um, oftentimes the brands are just products, you know, giving them free product um, in hopes that they will talk about the product and share it with, with their friends and family. Um, and so the, the brand did this on Red, Little Red Book, um, the, the platform I mentioned earlier, they, they worked with, you know, tons and tons of KOCs on the platform. And because of this, it just seemed like overnight, their name was, was everywhere. You know, they were just, it was like everywhere you turn, there's people talking about them. And it was like, it was almost like, how did this happen? Um, and it was, it's very discreet, right? Because you're working with so many small influencers. And then, and then once they did that, you know, once they kind of had this mass presence, then they started to spend money on bigger influencers and celebrities to really, you know, Know, push the brand and, and give it that reputation. So they've been leveraging that tactic. And they're actually a, a leader in, in, in another tactic that's been very talked about in 2019, which is called private traffic. Have you, have you heard of this concept no, before? explain that. Explain so, that to us. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So in, in the West, right, we... Um, we use, uh, you know, brands will, will have their own website um, and they will have their email lists, right? And that is your owned traffic, right? And then you have your public traffic on, you know, social media sites, um, on places that you don't, on, on sites that you don't own, right? But like we were mentioning, in China, everything's done on WeChat. Everything's done on Weibo. Everything is done on social media. Like Chinese people do not read email unless you force them to. Like they really, they don't read emails. They don't use websites. Like everything is done on social media platforms. And so it's really difficult as a brand to have that owned traffic because it's it's none of the traffic is really yours at the end of the day the platform could take it all away from you like it's not yours at the beginning of 2019 uh we're, there was really a, a shift in um it was getting a lot harder it was getting more expensive for brands to acquire new users on a lot of chinese social media platforms um because it, it's just become so saturated and so brands started to think a lot more about well we can't have this owned traffic but we can have this private traffic which is it's it, it's it's similar to owned traffic so for example th the most common one is that brands will open these uh, chat groups on WeChat, um, if you've ever used WeChat, you can create um, up to 500 member mm -hmm. chat groups. And so brands will actually create 
hundreds of chat groups that they're that uh, fans or followers of the brand, you know, people could join the group to get, you know, exclusive information about, about the brand. Um, ex- you know, they know about the launch of products earlier, um, things like that. Um, this was, I mean, this concept was actually really started by influencers, um, who, who, who felt this, uh, they felt this phenomenon of like, it was harder to get new, new followers. So they started thinking about like how they could own their, their follower base more. And so they started doing this and now a lot of brands are doing this as well. So perfect diary, um, that, that cosmetics brand, they have thousands of 500 member WeChat groups where they send tons of product information. They share their WeChat e-commerce mini programs. They talk about how you can use their products. Um, people buy products and then they share, share photos of, of how they've used the products in their groups. Um, and, and, and why this is significant is that you're in somebody's chat group. It's a much closer connection than somebody just following your brand account. It makes you feel a lot closer to the brand than you would by just following a page that they've created and and writing a comment on it. You know, you can access somebody from the brand at, at any moment right in your chat app. And for the brand, they have a much closer connection with you as well, because it's much more likely that you will see what they're sharing in this group. It's, it's a lot less likely that you're going to scroll through all your, all the newest posts on Weibo and just happen to see this information from the brand in your feed. If, if that makes any sense, as I said, it's a bit of a complex, a bit of a complex um, word, (laughs) but it's, I mean, I mean, if, if, I guess if, if people really in the West don't quite conceptualize what that looks like, just think about a brand having a thousand Facebook groups. Right. And, and the, and, and brands and influencers are pushing people very hard to, to get into these groups, um, by incentivizing them. Like I said, with, you know, um, they, they know about new products, they have access to new products. They have access to, um, you know, coupons and discounts. Um, they, uh, you know, for example, a lot of influencers will, um, uh, ask people in the group their opinions on certain topics or they'll even request, um, you know, pictures from their fans of, of them using certain products and then they'll actually feature them in their content. Or, you know, for example, I'm sure I, you know, I talked about just then go, go boy inviting fans to the Porsche event. You know, a lot of, a lot of influencers are, they're only inviting fans that are in those groups. Um, mm. So they, they're they really developing like these armies of, of super fans as well. Do you find that, because I, I, I've always found that, um, especially in Chinese, they, they really love to be trendsetters, right? And they love to kind of be first onto things. So, so these groups are magic um, mm-hmm. for them as well. Do you find that there is a organic amplification or marketing that gets to happen when they, if they release something into all those groups? So you've got a thousand groups of 500 people each who probably are willing to and likely to if you give them some news first they're going to go and they're going to retweet right they're going to go reshare they're going to go post that in their moments and they're going to actually amplify your own marketing efforts for you do you exactly exactly so um brands that are smart these days um you know for example there's um WeChat uh, influencers, right? They have their own WeChat official accounts. And so a lot of brands, it's very expensive to work with large WeChat influencers um, to, you know, to write an article um, about your brand. And a lot of brands these days are actually going to these influencers and say, Hey, why don't, how, how, like, how, how about we pay you to talk about our brand in your groups instead? Um, Because, because of that, that effect, right? It's, it's a, it's, actually more powerful in many ways let me ask you a simple math question is 500 micro influencers with 20,000 followers equal to worth less or worth more than one influencer who has a million yeah a lot of brands will come and say okay i have this much money should i hire one or two big influencers or should i hire lots of small influencers or and then of course there's mid-tier influencers too right so it, it's really depends on the 
goal of the brand um, and the brand's reputation in China and the audience that they're looking to reach. Smaller influencers are going to come across as more authentic. They're going to have a closer relationship with their followers. So, and, and these days, uh, smaller influencers are in some senses becoming much more in demand because the big influencers have, have become so commercialized. So we see brands working with smaller influencers much more. But at the same time, these larger influencers, they have this clout, right? And they have spent years and years and years developing a reputation and they don't choose if you choose the right influencer, that is, you know, you choose the right top tier influencer, you know, they, they're very selective about who they work with. And so any of their followers, any, and, and not even just their followers, right? Other people, um, if, if they, if, the, if that person works with your brand, they're putting their reputation on the line. So by that person saying that they, it's, it's like, uh, you know, in, in, uh, I, th I think of, you know, like a as soon as a celebrity or say like, you know, <laughs> Meghan Markle wears a dress from a certain fashion brand, everyone wants to know where that dress is from. It's the same thing with these influencers. You know, if, if they're willing to talk about your product, then that immediately just gives you that reputation and status that, oh, this must be, this must be good. Um, and that the smaller influencers cannot, they cannot give that to you. Tell us a little bit about the world of live streaming in China. What's going to be uh, most relevant is uh, e-commerce live streaming, which has, is what has become really popular over the course of 2019. I mean, but live streaming has been around in China for a very long time. In 2016 and 2017, um, like what I refer to as entertainment live streaming was, was very popular. Um, and, and that trend somewhat translated over to the U.S., but never really took off in the same way that it, it, it took off in China. A lot of investors, investors are very interested in, in um, entertainment live streaming um, and gaming live streaming. Um, oh, I, for I, sure. You know, that's, I, Follow speak, the money. I, I speak with a lot of, um, yeah. a lot of investors about that topic. Um, but when it comes to uh, brands, brands are going to be more interested in this new trend of e-commerce live streaming. This trend has been led by uh, Alibaba um, with their Taobao live streaming platform. They actually started developing this in... Um, I believe in late 2016, early 2017, but 2019 was really a, a, a tipping point for them. And it's just become a, a, a massive phenomenon over the past year. There's other platforms who are, are doing it as well, but I would really say that Taobao live streaming is, is, is the leader in the space. But um, essentially, you know, there are these live streamers who similar to, you know, I guess you could say similar to the home shopping network or QVC is, you know, they're sitting in front of a camera, they're talking about products and, and reviewing them, how to use the products, what they're made of. Um, and people while they're watching the live stream can, you know, click on the shopping cart, see the item that's being talked about and, and purchase it while they're, you know, still watching the, the live stream. The one other thing that um, has, has really helped with uh, e-commerce live streaming taking off in, in, in China is that w one of the main audience groups for e-commerce live streaming is uh, consumers, uh, our consumers in, in lower tier cities in China who have um, more free time, uh, disposable income, uh, and, and less exposure to, to, to products and, and, and brands. So, so they, you know, stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, less physical retail. Right, 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 right. And so, um, and 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 they look to these live streamers to to discover new brands and products and and get advice. Um, and so, I think that in the West, um, you know, if it's going to take off here, whoever does it needs to target. Simil I mean, there are similar audiences in Western countries, um, mm -hmm. you know, or in emerging countries. Um, but I think that they need to try and target those people, not the not the busy people who don't have time to watch live streams. Explain to us a little bit about how social commerce uh, works in China. Um, just and give the audience a little bit of a quick introduction and what are they doing really well? Yeah. So, I mean, social commerce is essentially the use of a social network to 
drive e-commerce transactions, right? So it's just the mix of social with commerce. Um, I think that uh, for, for Western audiences, maybe the most uh, relevant example would be, you know, I guess when it was earlier or mid 2019, uh, Instagram finally, you can tell my sar- my sarcasm, <laughs> finally launched a shop Instagram where you could buy stuff from Instagram. Um, that's social commerce, right? You're buying things yeah. from a social platform. This has been going on in China for years and years and years. All social networks in China have e-commerce features. It's something they add very early on. And e-commerce platforms have social features. It's working extremely well in China because people like to hear about products from from friends and family. They are curious what other people are using. They uh, trust what other people are recommending to them. I think in China, um, one of the most talked about platforms for social commerce is is WeChat. Um, After WeChat added mini programs, which we we mentioned earlier, but I didn't explain what they are. Um, Mini programs are light apps that exist within the WeChat ecosystem. Um, So instead of downloading a a standalone app, you can just search for it within WeChat and and use this mini program, this app, um, without having to download it. Um, And so like I mentioned, there's a lot of e-commerce mini programs, or you could have a game mini program, a loyalty mini program, um, and and brands will use these and um, get consumers to share these, you know, share products, share a, a, a coupon, uh, share some kind of game that can help you win loyalty points um, with their other friends and family on, on WeChat. So uh, WeChat has really been a driver of the, the social commerce phenomenon in, in China. And mm. there have been some, some really great case studies over the past couple of years. Talk to us a little bit about where you still think Western brands are, you know, getting things wrong. What are they doing wrong on WeChat and uh, what does the future hold? Um, what are we going to see in 2020? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit similar to what we've been talking about before is that I think that a lot of brands are still in the mindset, um, the, the old WeChat mindset where they say, oh my God, WeChat has over 1 billion users. Like I'm going to use it to broadcast information about my brand and reach this massive audience. And I'm going to open an official account and get so many followers. And that's, you know, that's very like, five years ago. Um, and, and even then, you know, it's a, it's a, it's actually a closed platform. It's not that easy to, to, you know, build a following on WeChat. So I think that really, uh, last year and especially this year, it's, it's like I said, it's much more about thinking of WeChat as this, your core engagement platform with your audience. You know, WeChat should replace your your website, your email marketing, your loyalty program, your e-commerce, your um, customer payment service. systems. You know, it's 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 much more using it as a as a tool um, and less as a as a broadcast platform to to spread information to to users. It's more of a, a, a customer relationship tool. Lauren, I sometimes worry about the impact on mental health that um, this world of influencer marketing has. You had mentioned with the Gogo Boy and the Porsche, where a lot of people have come in with comments of saying, oh, I wish that was me. And I think in a lot of realms for maybe a lot of people, that that's a very dangerous thing. So flip that on me. Let's talk about something positive. Um, what are some, some positive things that you're seeing coming out from this world of influencer marketing? Yeah, so I yeah, I, I agree. I agree with the, what you're saying. There's a lot of um, negative impacts of, of influencer marketing and, you know, just how much time people are spending on their phones, how it's, you know, it's all about consumption. Um, but, but I do think that there's there's a couple of things that I've been seeing going on in the China space that that are, are, are good. And, and one is that this the concept of being an influencer uh social media has done incredible wonders for rural people in china um they there's a you know there's been uh, for years now right it's it's very difficult for young people to find 
jobs in rural areas in China. You know, as soon as they, you know, can leave, they, they leave and grandparents, parents are left behind. Um, you know, the, the young people leave, they have to go work in a big city. They're lonely. They live very difficult lifestyles, but it's, it's what they have to do if they want to, you know, make money, have any type of career. And uh, live streaming, uh, whether it's just entertainment live streaming, gaming live streaming, e-commerce live streaming, um, has actually become a top career choice uh, for people in lower tier cities in China. Um, and people are able to stay in their hometowns, be closer to their families, and be earning higher incomes than what they would have earned having to live in a, in a city far away from home. So I think in that respect, um, and, and not just that, you know, now we've seen, uh, like, Alibaba has created um, a, a huge initiative where they're actually training um, like farmers, um, uh, farmers and other, you know, small producers in rural, rural areas and lower tier cities, how to use e-commerce live streaming to sell their products. Um, that's actually a huge segment of e-commerce live streaming is buying, um, uh, local food products, locally sourced products. So that's something that's, I think that's really good. That's come out of, um, you know, social media influencer marketing. Along with, along with your question, you know, also just talking about how influencer marketing has, uh, really been, it, it, it's, it's all about consumption, right? It's, it's mm. encouraging people to consume, consume, buy more, consume, buy, buy, more, buy, more, buy. More, more. yeah. Uh, secondhand purchasing things secondhand, um, is actually uh, the, this trend is growing in China. So what what most people maybe outside of china or even those in china might not know is that buying things second hand was really a cultural taboo it's it's mm -hmm. been a cultural taboo mm -hmm. um you know coming out of the cultural revolution where you have nothing um you know it, it, this, this mindset of buying something used or just even using something that somebody has passed on to you it's that's a that's shameful Mm -hmm. um, it means that you don't have money to buy it yourself. It mm -hmm. means that you're having financial hardship. Like, you know, the concept of hand-me-down clothing, that, that, that just doesn't exist. Like, that would be embarrassing. You yeah. know, that's something that, like, maybe someone in the rural countryside would, would wear clothes passed down from somebody else, you know? You have to understand, I think, a bit of the cultural uh, connection behind this, the, the consumption trend. But now we're seeing, you know, with younger generations, they don't have as much of that mindset as, as their parents. Um, and you've been seeing a lot more growth in, in secondhand, whether it's from uh, electronics, to um, you know, school supply like like university textbooks uh, that that's become a big market for secondhand. Um, to even mm -hmm. luxury products, you're now seeing, you know, a, a lot of people are starting to accept buying a, a luxury handbag secondhand, and that it's it's okay. Again, Alibaba, um, they have this platform called Idle Fish, and it's a it's a secondhand platform and Alibaba is really pushing this platform. They've, they've game, gamified it. They're encouraging people to, you know, they're, they're making buying and selling things secondhand a good thing. They actually have this um, feature where if you've purchased something on Taobao within like a month, like on Taobao or Tmall within like a month, and then you decide that you're not going to use it again, um, you can actually like do this one click easy resell well where it'll like relist the product on idle fish and it'll actually say like it'll verify that you only purchased this product from like tmall like a month ago mm -hmm. um you know to make people more interested in in, in purchasing it um yeah. we've seen a lot of uh celebrities who have actually been selling off you know i mean celebrities are gifted things all the time and they've started uh selling off some of the, you know, the, the, the products that they get and actually donating it to charity. Um, you know, I saw one of my favorite influencers, Becky Lee, she, because she does get, she does buy so much stuff. Um, and she's like her, her closet gets so full that she regularly like goes through the closet and cleans it out and then sells her products on, you know, on idle fish. So, um, I, I, I do think that that, that economy, um, is, is going to start growing a lot more in the near future.
Lauren, you are the smartiest of smarty pants when it comes to digital marketing using bloggers, influencers, and KLLs in China. What is, you know, in that realm, what is your best piece of advice for brands that want to go to China and start to uh, attack with these strategies? Yeah, so I would go back to what I was kind of touching at earlier when you asked me, like, what global brands、um, are are you know doing effective influencer marketing, and I said. Well, actually, it's the Chinese domestic brands that I would look at.、Um, so my my key piece of advice would be be humble and look to your local Chinese competitors. 2020 is a very different world than even just three years ago.、Um, the past few years have seen an incredible shift of Chinese domestic brands coming out of the woodwork,、um, older brands reinventing themselves. Younger consumers being much more accepting of all things made in China, Chinese culture. It's it's a very different space than it was only a couple of years ago. And really going in there and looking at what your international competitors are doing, of course, is important. But if you really want to see how you should be reaching Chinese consumers,、um, I would say. Look at what your what the domestic competitors are doing. They are much more agile. They deeply understand the target audience. They what I love about them is that they're very much like ship it first and then iterate afterwards. They're not afraid to experiment with new social media platforms or new features that come out. So there's a, a lot that you can that you can learn from them. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lauren. How can our audience、uh, follow you, get in touch with you, buy your book? How do they find you? How do they get in touch with you? Sure. So、um, LinkedIn is probably the, the 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 best place to go to get all of I you know I share I write a lot of articles I, I create a lot of content and I share it all on LinkedIn. So that's just like a great place to go and find me.、Um, I also have a website which is just my name laurenhallinan dot com and I have a, a podcast on China influencer marketing. Well, it's actually we shift it. It's China marketing podcast now. It's not just influencer focus, but I have a marketing podcast. So yeah, that's probably. Probably a great place to start. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This is going to be、um, a very、uh, long and a, a very long and interesting episode for so many of our listeners.、Um, obviously, it's it helps when somebody on the other end is used to doing podcasts as well. So,、um, thanks for thanks for just bringing the amazing information and bringing the energy to the show today. Sure. Yeah. As you can tell, it's something I I love to talk about. Yeah. Passionate people about China makes for a great show. Thanks very much, Lauren. <laughs> Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market, exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the negotiation, and if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at wpic dot co, and be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.